Hello, uh, my name is Joe Doerr. Uh, I'm a uh, software engineer by background, and I retired a few years ago, and I took up uh, woodworking as a hobby. So I converted my basement into a workshop, um, and I started doing a number of things with wood. I have a CNC router. Um, uh, about a year and a half ago, I, I purchased a lathe, and I started playing around with that. Uh, and I got into segmented bowl turning. Okay, so, so here's an example of a solid segmented bowl I did. This is a relatively simple pattern. Okay, the interesting thing about, uh, that I like about segmented uh, bowl turning is the fact that normally when you're turning a bowl, right, the grain of the wood is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So when you start cutting, you're cutting side grain, end grain, side grain, end grain as, as, the, as the, uh, your stack rotates. Um, and end grain, if you've ever done this, uh, is more difficult. So you, you need technique, and personally I don't have it. I'm not, I'm cons I consider myself a novice turner. However, if you do segmented turning, like if you look at this, the nice thing about segment turning is that all of these pieces, individual pieces that line up, you're always dealing with side grain. You're never dealing with end grain, except on the base piece, of course. That that's, has the same problem that that uh, normal bowl turning has. You can't avoid that. But most of the bowl is very easy to turn, okay? So that's why I got into it. I liked it. Then I got into open segmented turning, which is a lot... More, more interesting, I think. So here's an example of a bowl that I did. Uh, now this is not my, uh, I didn't come up with the design, I found it, someone else had done it, and I copied it. Um, so, you know, I'm not, it's not from a uh, artistic point of view, I don't take any credit. <clears throat> but, so this particular bowl has, in e is 15 rings of open segments, right? Each ring has 24 individual pieces of wood that are individually glued. And then the cap ring on top has half that number. It's got 12. So it's a, there's a total of 373 um, individual pieces of wood here. The base, 12 for the cap ring, and then 360 of these, 15 times 24. So you, see, you can come up with some pretty interesting patterns here. Now... This bowl, of course, is not great for holding soup, but it's really an attractive, uh, an attractive thing. Now, I've done bowls with with twenty four like this. I've done them with forty eight segments per ring, and the biggest one I've done so far that was successful was I did a seventy two segments per ring, and that had a total of sixteen hundred and seventy five pieces. Um, that takes a while, right? I can do up to about three segments a day. So if I'm doing 20, 30 segments, it's gonna take me a couple of weeks to, to put it all together and then to finish it and everything else. So, um, so it takes a while, but so it's more prep than actual turning. So some people don't like that, but for me, uh, I find it fascinating. So I've also had a disaster, right? So this, this one I tried, this, uh, as you can see, turned into a, a lampshade. Um, this has 96 segments per ring. Um, however, I had a, a bit of a problem. You can't really see it too well, but uh, some of the pieces chipped out. So these pieces are very, very tiny and they stick out and you can very easily snap them off and uh, I did that. So so I, I don't know if I'm gonna do 96 again uh, in, the, in the near term, but what I'm gonna do, when I'm gonna start today is another 72 uh, segment uh, bowl, a big bowl that's gonna be about 13, maybe 13 and a half inches in diameter, maybe six inches tall, uh, that will um, have a total of about 2,100 uh, individual segments. And I'm going to document this whole thing, so if anyone is crazy enough to do what I'm doing, maybe I, maybe I can solve some problems that, so you don't have to in, encounter them as well. So when you start out with the project, 
you need to create three documents. Okay, so the first one is this document, right? So this is just a hand drawing. It's the actual size of the bowl. The, the bowl is going to be this size. And you notice that the, the, all this, it's hard to, hard to see here, but all along here, each one of those lines represents an individual tier of the an individual ring. So in this case, we're going to have 31 open segment rings and then a cap ring on top of it. Um, now I'm using very thin stock. I'm using 3 16th inch stock. So it makes it a little more difficult uh, and you end up having uh, you know, more wastage than you would if you're using you know, thicker stock. Um, you know, this, for example, this stock, this is probably you know, three quarters of an inch, each piece is three quarters of an inch in here. Uh, you know, this is probably three eighths, I'm guessing, or anywhere from a quarter to three eighths. Anyway, um, so this is going to be each of these things is going to be closer to this. Do you see how thin this stock is? Um, so this is that's the first document that, that you have to come up with your idea for the design. <clears throat> Then, based on, on, the, on the diameter, based on the diameter of each ring, right, you need to calculate uh, some information. And there are, you, have, you need to use a segment calculator. Uh, well, you don't. If you, know, if you know the math, you can do it by <laughs> yourself. But it's a lot easier to use one of these segment calculators. And there's, there's a bunch of free ones uh, online. Uh, and the one that I use uh, is uh, Larry Marley Art, right? So if you if you uh, search for Larry Marley and get his calculator, his segment calculator, um, you want you want to make sure you get version six two or greater. Anyway, um, so what you do is you input a, a, some information for each ring. You say, okay. Uh, the ring height, uh, the ring diameter. So you put in the ring height, the ring diameter, the wall thickness, which is as you go around the curve, it's the the distance from the inside top, uh, the outside top to the inside bottom, right? So it's that distance, and then it it will calculate for you, um, and, or the number of segments. Now. You can't see this here because I'm, I'm just holding this thing up. But I'm doing a 72 segment, um, 72 segments per ring bowl. But when I, the number of segments I put into the calculator was 96. Now why why is that? That's because none of these calculators uh, account for the gap between the open segments. So in the case of a 72, so this is my wedgie. I'll get into the wedgies in a minute. Um, this is my, my wedgie for 72 uh, segments. And you'll see that uh, it's marked as taking 3.75 degrees for the actual segment, and the spacing is 1.25 degrees. So the, the say, spacing is what we haven't accounted for. So... What I do is I, I take 360 degrees and I divide it by 3.75 in this case, and it comes up with 96. So I tell a segment calculator that I actually have 96 segments, even though I only have 72. And it will calculate the correct segment length, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this segment length that I need for each ring. So that's how you can use these segment calculators for open segment uh, bowls. Um, and it doesn't have to be exact. The one good thing about open segment turning is that uh, it's it's forgiving in, in a lot of ways. When you're doing a closed segment bowl like this, it's very unforgiving. These angles have to be exact. If you if the total number of degrees ends up being three fifty nine and a half, it won't fit. So you have it, it's a it's a very uh, precision. Uh, kind of a thing, and we'll do one at the end. The cap ring is a solid segment uh, ring, so you'll you'll see how you do that if you've never done that before. 
So now we know how to cut the segments. Now we need to come up with a pattern. So this is the third document that you want to come up with. Now, this document, um, I did it in Excel, but you can do it in other things. It's just so you can see all the different types of wood and, and what the pattern is going to look like. So this is a very simple weave pattern. Now, I'm going to be using uh, maple, walnut, uh, yellow heart, and pr a purple heart. So what I do is, in addition to, to th this design, at the bottom, right, I list for each uh, tier, for each ring, I, I list the number of each piece of wood I need. So in the case of... Um, the first ring, I need 12 maple, 24 walnut, 12 yellow heart, and 12 and 24 purple heart. That adds up to 72. For the second ring, I need no maple, 36 walnut, 12 yellow heart, 24 uh, purple heart, etc. So you get the idea. But what you try to do is come up with something that so you can visualize what the pattern is. Um, and one thing to, to keep in, in mind, when you look at this, you'll see straight lines, right? So these diagonal lines appear to be straight, but actually in the bowl, they will not be straight. And the reason for that is, unless you're, you're creating a bowl that's straight up with where, the, where the diameter doesn't change, by changing the diameter, you are making the pieces bigger. You know, the pieces of, so if you look at this, this looks like these, these lines are curving. But when I, when you, when you look at it on the, on the design sheet, they're not. So that's what I'm talking about. So it's actually nice because you get, end up getting uh, a very pleasant um, design out of the, these things. Uh, really, it's just a side benefit of the fact that the diameter is expanding and therefore the size of each of these pieces is, is changing and you get this gentle curve, which is very nice. Um, and then, so the first thing you, you want to do is start out, create a base. Now I'm going to show you, I created this base. Now I have a CNC router. So, um, what I end up doing is I did an inlay in here with the CNC router so that my pattern, I can bring the base of the thing into the pattern. You'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about when I, when we, when we st start to get going. But I realize never, not everyone has a CNC router. You don't need it. I mean, you can just have a plain, you know, piece of walnut like I have here or or something else. You do not need, you know, to, to do that. Now, if you do, if you are going to use a CNC router and you, and you are doing a pattern like this, you have to make sure that the centers are exactly lined up with the center on the lathe, right? So as this thing is spinning, this thing can't be wobbling at all because then then the pattern is going to, it's going to, um, uh, be messed up. So the way I got around that, so if, you, if you're using a CNC router and you want to do this, so this uh, is exactly a five inch circle. So my waste block, I cut as a, uh, I cut both of these things separately on a, on the CNC router at, at five inches exactly. Also, the faceplate that I'm using is four and a half inches. So what I did, and you can't see it here, but I created a little um, uh, pocket that this faceplate sits in. It's just like a sixteenth of an inch deep, so that I know that that all of my centers are lined up. So again, most people are not going to have a, have access to a CNC router. That's fine. You don't need it. Uh, I just want to show you if you if you are going to use it, that's one way of doing it. So. <laughs> The reason that it works so well is because this is five inches and that's five inches. When you glue it up, you can do it by feel. And that will, you know, make sure that, that the centers stay aligned. Anyway, so how do you do this thing? So, well, you need a couple of, uh, of jigs to, to do it. Uh, so there is a... Um, There's a company called Seg Easy, right? They, if you go up to their their site, it's S E G 
E-A-S-Y, Seg, Seg Easy. If you go up there, they, they sell uh, these, what they call wedgie plates. This, mine, this one I made myself, so it doesn't look like this. It, it's this color. And these are, these are what they call uh, open segment plates, I think. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be using the, these kinds of things, but not the way that they advertise using them. The way they, where they, the way they advertise using them is you actually put the pieces here, you put a rubber band around it, I think, and you, and you glue it on in one, one, uh, in one operation. When you're doing, they go up to, to at most 48 segments. The, the highest number of segments they have for their plates is 48 segments. But if you want to go higher than that, 60, 72, 96, uh, you really can't do that. It's impractical. Plus, I think it's impractical when you're doing very thin stock. I don't see how you would get that to work um, with uh, 360 inches of stock. Maybe you can. I never tried it, so I, you know, I could be wrong. So, so what I ended up doing was I created my own plate on the CNC router with just clear plexiglass, right? So this is, this represents the uh, 72 segments, right? And I'll show you how I use this thing. It's really, it's, it's I find it invaluable, um, mainly because one of, the, one of the things that I had originally worried about was, um, getting pattern errors where you, you, you get to the end and you realize, you know, a couple of, uh, a couple of pieces are out of order and, and that's just horrible. So I, I was paranoid about that. So I came up with an, an approach, um, a procedure that, uh, hopefully eliminates that. And so far I've ne I've never had uh, a pattern and I've done probably seven or 8,000 segments, uh, without a single pattern error. So, also at that at that seg easy though are plans for two jigs that, that are very helpful. One is called a wedgie sled, um, and the other is a a, a, um, a stop. Okay, and I'll show you. Anyway, so the way this works is that this sled has two fences on it, and this and the wedgie that you use is designed so this wedgie is the same angle as is needed for the 72 so it's it's the angle between these uh two things is exactly 3.75 degrees so what you do is you you stick this in here and you open these up and you adjust them so that a the back of this thing will be flush against the back of the of the jig and then these fences snug up to this. So now these fences are exactly 3.75 degrees off. The other thing you need is a stop. So the way this works, let me just, we're not gonna do it right now, but I'll just show you, give you an idea is, you'd come in here, you'd set up whatever distance you need with a caliper, and you come here, and you'd cut and then go to the next one, back and forth. And you get an exact, that makes sense. Right now, what I'm gonna do is I haven't uh, dimensioned the wood yet. Um, so I'm probably gonna come back and, uh, and finish this up. Uh, and then this is gonna take a couple of weeks probably. So what I'll do is at just key points during the, the process, I'll bring you guys back in um, and record it so that you don't have to sit there for hours and hours watching me do repetitive stuff. Okay. Okay, so we're we're back in the shop. I uh, finished dimensioning the wood for the first uh, couple of uh, tiers of the open segments. Uh, so here are the four pieces of wood. Um, now... One thing I, I did that I didn't mention before was, I don't know if you could see it, but I've beveled uh, the two edges, slightly beveled, uh, about half of the edge on opposite corners, right? I'll tell you why that, 
uh, I did that, it's because, first of all, those edges are going to have to come off anyway, uh, and it just eliminates having to remove them later on, and also eliminates uh, a higher risk of snapping off uh, the pieces, but also because um, I look for a bias in the, in the grain pattern. So if the grain pattern is going either completely straight across or completely up and down, it doesn't really matter. But if there's a bias to it, it's going at an angle, that's what I take off. I take off that edge. Uh, and that, uh, I think, will prevent uh, more splitting and more snapping. We'll see. Anyway, we're going to start to do the cutting now. I'll show you how that works. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you how I use, uh, part of how I use the, um, this uh, wedgie plate. Okay, so let's start this process. Now, one thing you'll notice is so I, I built this thing here. It's just a box that's uh, kind of padded on the inside. It's got the cork and some felt here. Um, because what was happening was on the very small pieces of stock, as I'd cut them off on the table saw, a lot of times they would just ping and, and you know, go flying over my head or they'd go underneath the, uh, uh, the workbench. So this is just really to protect the pieces and to, and to prevent them from flying all over the place. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to cut um, maybe half a dozen pieces just to make sure I have the right size. What I have done, by the way, is I, I used a caliper and I set my, the stop block to, uh, in this case, 0.22 inches um, because that's what the, the uh, Morley Art segment turning calculator said was my segment length. All right, so let's try this. I'm going to put on my dust collector first. First, I want to do one cut. To get my edge straight. And then I just go back and forth. Okay, now what I'm going to do, push this down a little bit, so you can see it. What I'm going to do is take those pieces that I cut, thought I cut more, but what did I cut? Five pieces, okay. So I'm going to place them in here. Now I'm doing a little sanity check here. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah, so what I'm going to do is uh, take a ruler and measure the diameter to the outside. It's about seven inches, which is, which is close enough for me. Uh, it was uh, 6.375 inches. I don't mind it being a little too wide. Uh, because what that means is that if it's a little too wide out here, it'll just mean that these gaps are, are narrower when I glue it together. Which on the first couple of um, on the first couple of tiers, I don't care about. As a matter of fact, I prefer it because then you get more overlap on the next uh, on the next wing when you go to glue it. So I'm going to leave it like this. Okay, here we are on the other side of my shop. Um, I finished cutting the first ring of segments, okay? As you can see, they're laid out on this plate here. And this is one of the reasons why I love the plate, because uh, what I was able to do, I, I came up with a procedure that, if we look at this document, which is what, what we created for the, for the template, 
I should always start on the left-hand side and go left to right here. And I lay the pieces down, the first piece, and then I go counterclockwise. So I'm always going left to right, counterclockwise. And I'm consistent with that. And if I, and because I do that, I never have a pattern error. Now, you'll notice, let me take this piece out. This is the first piece I do. This is the, the piece that represents the bottom left-hand corner square. And if you look, I've made uh, a number one on it with a, a thin marker. Um, so what I end up doing is numbering each of the, of the rings as, as we add them up. And the reason for that is um, you can also get a pattern error if you, if you forget which ring you're on and you end up either duplicating a ring. Now, it, it, obviously, in the beginning, the first one, two, three, that, that's unlikely. But when you get up into the teens, 1920, sometimes you forget, oh, did I do 19 or am I about to do 19? So this makes it unambiguous. You don't have to count the rings, which you could make a mistake when you get you know, counting up to 20, you, maybe, you, maybe you skip a ring. So this eliminates that possibility too. So between those two things, um, I'm able to, I, I've never had a, a pattern error. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna set up two jigs on the, on the lathe. Uh, it's, a, it's a segment wheel right, which is actually supplied by uh, a company called Chefware Kits. There's two jigs I'm going to be using for this. One is this indexing wheel, uh, and the other is this platform uh, for doing the gluing. So let me move the camera. So this is my lathe. Now, one thing I'll, t I'll mention to you is before I put the, the, the indexing plate on, uh, I use one of these washers to keep the plate away from the from the back of, of the uh, the lathe because it was rubbing. So you might need that as well. So here's the plate that is supplied by this, this company. If you notice, we're going in the, the, the second ring in we're using, and I've made a mark every other hole. Uh, so the outside ring has 192 uh, holes in it. The next one in has 144. Since we're doing 72 um, segment ring, we'll use the second one in and we'll, do, and we'll go every other one. So, so this is the one you would use for 72. So I'm going to put this here. Oops. I'll be right back. I have to get my uh, my bottom. Okay, so this is the, the bottom of the bowl that I showed you before. And we're gonna screw this on here. Um, hold on a second. And I'm gonna sock it up. I lock the, uh, the lathe. And I'll sock it up. So, so now if I unlock it, this lathe, this thing should be spinning straight and true, which it is. Okay. So now, this is the other jig. All right, this is the thing that we're going to use uh, to do the gluing. So, so the one thing you do is you check to make sure that this thing is level, which it is. Also, just to be, be aware that, that there's nothing holding this thing. This is a, actually a free-spinning um, jig here. So if you actually, when, once we start gluing, if you ac accidentally hit this thing, it will knock the piece that you just glued off, and maybe more than one. So you got to be careful a little bit with that. Okay, so this looks good. Now, as you said, as you saw, that I... I um, made a mark over here for the, for, for the, um, it's the second ring in. So what I normally do is once I, once I get this adjusted, I'll just make sure that as I go around, it'll fit in all the other holes. It usually does. It's not a problem. So let's pick this hole. 
because it's close enough. Oh, no, I'm going to pick this one. That's, this one is closest. Okay. So let me grab that first piece. So this is the one that's labeled with one. Now I have to set up the diameter of this thing. And it's 6.38 inches, I believe. Yes. So that would be 3 inches and 3 sixteenths. Okay, so I think that's right. So this is going to go here. And I just want to make sure that it's lining up with, it's being centered right where that, um, star is point is is so it's a little off so now that this thing is locked in I'm just going to move this back a tad that looks good okay so here's the process we're going to take and put some of this glue on the, the bottom of, of this piece. Not a lot. You don't want it to have a, a lot of squeeze out. Um, it's uh, tight bond glue, but it's called quick and thick. And uh, you really want to use this glue as opposed to regular tight bond because use regular tight bond, it'll take a lot longer. So here's, here's what happens. So I put a little, you can only see it, it's just a thin coat of glue and I put it on this jig and I take a piece of wood. So I'm just gonna butt it up against this stop and hold it for a 10 count. So you push into there, give it a little pressure and you count to 10, done. Then you get, what you do is you move to the next guy. That, and that didn't work, look. Interesting. So, as you can see, it's it's held on there, but it's very tentative, right? So, once that glue dries, it'll be great. But right right now. It's uh, very tentative. So um, you just have to be careful, that's all. All right, so let me get the next one. Now, as I mentioned, this is the, the slot that that one just came out of. So what I do is I pick the next one off count, going counterclockwise. You see that the, these pieces are almost touching. Anyway, I'm not going to let you watch me uh, do all of this thing because the 72 of these pieces, it takes about an hour uh, to do all 72. So I'll come back when I'm just about done with this, with this tier, and then we'll go on to the next. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'm back now. Um, I finished the first uh, ring. It's the glue is dry, and so the, now what I'm going to show you is how you have to prepare to put that before you put the next ring on. The first thing we have to do is sand this down. It, you don't. It doesn't seem like you would have to because you know the the uh, thicknesses of all this wood were the same, but you do. So you have to sand in between uh, each ring. So the first thing we have to remember to do is to back this jig off because it's preventing the the lathe from turning. And if you turn the lathe on with this thing engaged, bad things happen. So, uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is set the lathe speed very slowly. I've got it set to 160. Um, 
and I'm going to take and make some marks on this wood with a, with a soft tip pencil. Now I use a 4B pencil because it, it won't uh, make any marks, uh, permanent marks on the wood. It'll just put the, um, it won't put any dents into the wood. It'll just put the, uh, the graphite on there. Anyway, so here we go. We're going to turn it on. I'm going to make some con concentric rings here. Now this is a pretty wide ring. I don't normally put this many on there, but uh, I probably normally put about four. But and then I look at each one of these things to make sure that there's marks. If there's any low spots, I'll, I'll you know I'll fix them by hand. Like I'll just make another mark by hand. And now what I'm going to do is is sand that off. Um, let me reposition the camera. So the first thing is. What I used to sand this is this kind of a rigid sled that I made. You can use um, a flat board if, as long as the board is completely flat. I prefer to use this for two reasons. One, I know it's a, it's a, a rigid board made of three-quarter ply. I know it's completely flat. Um, but the other thing is these, these uh, cross members uh, give me something to hold on to. So, what you end up doing is Porter Cable makes uh, some 80 grit sandpaper that's adhesive backed. I guess other companies do as well. Anyway, it's on a roll, and that's what I put on here. So it's four and a half inches, uh, two side by side. This is nine inches wide by probably, I don't know, 20, 24 inches high. So, let me put an N95 mask on. And I'm also going to put on uh, my dust collector. So I got some pretty good suction out of this guy. Oh, got to open him up first. So I got some pretty good suction out of this. Now I'm going to turn the speed up to about 350. You have to be very careful approaching this thing because it's very, if you were to touch the edge of this, with the edge of that, this will snap off. So be very careful as you approach it. Get very close before you turn anything on. You're just a little bit away and then you can do it. Okay, let's do this. Now I'm checking. Oh, there's still some marks. It's not done yet. That's good. That's all the marks are, are gone. What I'm going to do now is blow the uh, sawdust away with some compressed air. Okay. So now it's ready to have the second um, ring uh, glued. Now what I'll say is, 
If you look, I've made a, spe a, a deeper mark on the first hole. This corresponded to the number one um, segment here. Now, because it has to be staggered uh, on each row, what we're going to end up doing is, for odd number rows, one, three, five, seven, we're going to use the holes at the marks. For even number rows, two, four, six, eight, we're going to go in between the marks, and that'll give us the stagger. That's why um, to do a 72-inch uh, uh, ring, you need 144 holes. Um, that makes sense. So I've already cut the next ring's worth of segments. And again, if you look at this guy, I've marked it with number two. So eventually, It'll come one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, uh, so <clears throat> I thought that's about all the information I think I can uh, impart at this juncture. What, what we would do now, oh, that's not true. One thing I'm gonna do is, is take a wet rag. I'm not gonna show it to you, but I'm gonna take a damp cloth and wipe it on the surface here to remove any um, residual uh, sawdust, microscopic sawdust on there. I used to uh, use a tack cloth um, on that, but the problem with the tack cloth, I think, is that I, I believe it left some residue on the surface, uh, some resin, and I think that interfere, could interfere with the, the gluing. So I don't do that anymore. What I do now is just take a very damp cloth and just wipe it over. That, that gets rid of any excess uh, sawdust, which will make the glue um, a better adhesion between this and the next ring. Okay, so I think that's that's all it, it for now. I'll, I will have, you have to move this jig back up to here, set this between, set this right there, and then I can start to do the next ring and, and glue the next guy. Now, um, I'm not going to have you watch me glue any more rings. I'll wait until we get up to about 10 uh, rings into this thing. And at that point, what I'm going to start to do is to shape the outside, but mainly the inside. The reason I do that uh, is because I don't want to wait until the bowl gets out a full six inches because it makes it harder to do this area. And this is the the more delicate area, the, the transition between this flat area and the bowl, and the curved part of the bowl can be a little tricky. And, and so you, you want as much control as possible. So I'll, I'll only go, go out to about, um, go out to about 10, I think, and then I'll start to, to shape the, uh, the inside of the bowl. So when I, that'll probably take me three or four days because as I mentioned before, I can only do probably about three rings a day. Um, and the reason for that is between cutting the, the pieces and doing the glue up, it's about an hour and a half per ring on a 72, um, on a segment two, 72 segment ring. However, you also have to wait in between for the glue to dry. So I usually wait a couple hours. So that's why I, I, I limit myself to about three a day. There was. I might be able to do four a day if I'm, you know, want to work till 11 o'clock at night, but generally it's about three a day I, I can do with this. So it'll take me, you know, a good three or four days before I can come back, uh, and then we'll 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 see how i uh, how I approach the uh, the problem of getting this into a, closer to its final shape. Okay, I'm back. Um, so so far, I've gotten 11 rings uh, finished, and I'm just about to do the, the 12th ring, and then we'll go into trying to smooth out uh, the bottom of the bowl. Um, anyway, I just wanted to show you, because uh, I hadn't given you a good uh, glimpse the last time of how, how this works, but here I've laid out all of the, all of the um, 
segments for the 12th ring. And so just to reiterate, this is the stock that I was using, part of the stock I was using. And if you notice, let me get up here. Where is it? Okay, if you look in there, um, you can see a, a slight chamfer on dia opposite diagonal uh, corners. And so if you look at it on here, so this, this, this width over here, lengthwise, that's the rip width. This width at the top of the, the widest part is the segment length. All right, so you get that, you get what you need there for each ring based on this uh, calculator info. So for the 12th ring, we needed a rip width of 0.85 inches, which we have, and we needed a segment length of 0.38 inches. All right, so, so I've done that. Um, the next thing I do is I look at this document Okay, and I look at, at row tw uh, ring 12, and down at the bottom, uh, under ring 12, it says I need 36 walnut, 12 yellow heart, and 24 purple heart. So that's what I cut, and then I laid them out according to what it says for number 12, which is the first one is a purple heart, followed by three walnut, followed by a purple heart, yellow heart, purple heart, and that repeats those six that repeats every six all the way around. So that's what we have here. So you'll notice that there's a slight variance. Some of these are, are, are further out than others. You can tolerate a little bit of a variance. Uh, no one will see it because when these things get glued together, it just means that um, the, there's a, a very slight variance between the, the, uh, the gaps between them and you'll never notice it. So. What I have here is I've marked the first one according to what this chart says, right? So this chart says the first one is a purple heart. So this is the first one. And again, I put the number 12 on there because it's the 12th ring. I'll show you what that looks like after we get this all glued up. So what I do, <coughs> is I take the first one and this, this um, sanding platform that I use to, to, to sand it, I also use over here and I just take it and I scrape it along just to take off any burrs or, and also I think it makes it um, uh, a, a better glue joint. So I take the cap off, put a little bit of glue on, and I'll leave the, the cap off while I'm doing a ring and I just put it uh, upside down inside, inside a, uh, a tape roll there so that, actually, I need a little more glue. Um, so that I don't have to, so that the glue doesn't drain back down and I have to squeeze it back up to the top. So you don't put a lot of glue on. So here's what the glue looks like on. So you, you don't gob it on there because you don't want a lot of squeeze out. So I'm just coming over to the thing. You can't see it, obviously. And I'm just holding it for a 10 count. Now, since this was an even number ring, so for the odd number rings, remember, we, we start at the, at, the, at the first mark that I made on that indexing wheel. For the even number ones, we go between the first and second marks. So for even ones, we're going between the marks. For, for odd ones, we go um, on the marks. So all I do now is, remember as I laid it out, I went left to right across here and I'm going counterclockwise. So I've got my, my gap here. I just pick the next one off and I just keep moving around. Uh, it's quite simple. When I get to the end, I stop, wait for it to dry, and then we'll come back and I'll show you um, how we can start to turn the inside of the bottom. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we are back with the, uh, <coughs> the 12th 
uh, ring having been glued on, and it, the glue should be dry by now. Um, I just wanted to show you the outside of the bowl uh, for a second. Um, <clears throat> you can see that this one of the chamfers, the outside chamfer, uh, helps a little bit because it removes what would have otherwise been a square piece of wood just sticking out uh, and, you know, giving us more danger of, um, you know, of splitting the wood. Um, you can also look and see these are the numbers for the rings. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So this is what I use to make sure that I don't uh, duplicate uh, or skip any any ring. Um, and so far it's been successful. I haven't made that mistake. Uh, you'll also notice that <clears throat> the inside ring here sticks out quite a bit. This might be a little too aggressive. So when I when I end up smoothing this out, I have to be really careful that I don't snap any of these off because it has a, quite a bit of leverage out in the open like that. So what I may do when we, when we start to do the outside of the bowl, which won't be till the end of the process, um, is I might, I might actually just sand it off. Uh, I'll see how, see how I feel about that. Uh, I might not take a tool to it at all. Um, but anyway, so here's the, here's the outside of the bowl. I'm going to reposition uh, the uh, camera so you can see the inside of the bowl. And what we'll try to do is smooth out the inside of the bowl. We're not going to touch the outside yet. We're going to wait until we finish the bowl before we do that um, because I don't want to uh, risk weakening any of this, taking any material off at this point. Um, but the inside, bowl is, uh, inside of the bowl is important that we smooth it out when we have better access to it uh, at this stage. Okay, I'm going to re reposition the uh, camera now. Okay, here's the inside of the bowl. Um, and what we want to do is, is start to do this transition from the flat surface into this. Now, one thing I will uh, mention is uh, at this stage, this outer ring has got almost no support on it. So I don't like to get any within like three, um, three tiers or three rings of the of the top ring uh, at this point just because these in, these rings at the top don't have a lot of support Try um, cutting at this point I'm going to be using a uh, negative rake, rake sc scraper here to try to take a very uh, unaggressive uh, cut at this thing because I'm very paranoid about these things snapping off so so this guy is is adjusted so he's right at the center line and we'll see how this goes. Put a mask on. I'm going to set this to about, I don't know, 400. And it's starting to get to get uh, smooth. And I don't have any major disasters yet. Okay, that's close enough. I'll probably do a little bit more uh, just to clean it up a little bit. But that's I think shows you how the how the process works to get this this area is smooth, um, a transition from here to here. And that's all we're looking to do at this point. The rest of it will be done at the end when we, uh, you know, when we, when we turn down everything, both the complete inside and the outside. Um, <clears throat> so I guess 
Uh, at this point, I can I can uh, stop this video, um, and now uh, I'll return when I get all of the segments on. We've got 12 segments, 12 open segments on, uh, open segment rings on. We will end up with 31 open segment rings, and then I'll come back uh, when we start to do the cap ring and show you how that's done. Okay, we're back. Um, so, I've glued up all of the uh, open segment uh, open segments except for two. And we're down to the last two. Uh, so there's, right now there's 2,230 glued segments. We're about to add the last two. Um, so I wanted to show you uh, the issue that I ran into actually on the first tier. So I don't know if you remember when when I glued the first piece on, on the first ring, it, it didn't hold right away. I had to redo it. And I found that happened quite, quite a bit on that, on that first ring. And I've noticed that happening before on other, um, on other bowls I've done. And I think the, the reason is, well, it was exacerbated this time because um, I had so much overhang uh, on that first uh, ring where a lot, a lot of the pieces, the pieces were hanging, you know, out into space um, with no glue on them. Um, but I also think that uh, because you're doing a flat surface and a flat surface, you get that kind of effect, you know, when you have uh, two pieces of, of uh, flat board and you put uh, glue on them and you try to clamp it, they start to move on you. It's like, like a frictionless puck. The, the glue itself forms like a layer. So I think that has something to do with it. You don't run into that problem on any of the other tiers because uh, you have this gap. You're actually gluing over the gap. And I think there's a little bit of squeeze out that goes in there, no matter how little glue you put on there. And that's enough to prevent that kind of a slide action. Anyway, I wanted to show you how I, what I did to get around that. that. Let me just uh, glue this up. Just uh, put just a little bit of glue on there. Take your stick and you put pressure against it for a 10 count. So I did that. And then all I did on that first tier and that first tier only is I took a little bit of masking tape, a little piece of masking tape, and I put it over here to give it some added support. And I kept doing that as going around. At the end, I just pull off the masking tape. And that was it. That's all I had to do. That's even too big a piece of the masking tape. But anyway, I just want to show you in case you run into that problem on the first ring. So now let's advance to the next, to the last piece. And I'll show you how you back this thing off safely. And I'm gluing up another one, the last piece. So, what, what I like to do is keep pressure on the piece as I back this this thing out because I've had situations where if there's a little bit of glue that ends up you know on the ruler or whatever this thing can actually get slightly stuck to the to the platform when you back it out you can pull it off so what I do is I just pull back the banjo an inch loosen up the tailstock and then back the tailstock off and then you're done what we're going to do is Take this um, this jig off of here, and I'll show you what what you get with the jig. So the jig that you get from Chefware Kits consists of this piece and this uh, a post with the with the uh, locking collar. And actually, when this this comes, it's it's not put together. It's block of wood, 
another block of wood up for this stop under here. This this piece, which is really the critical piece, um, piece of angle aluminum, this stop, and a ruler. So um, it's pretty bare bones. You can make one yourself probably. Um, but if you go up to Sheffer Kits, they will sell this as an individual jig or, and this as an individual jig. And then I think they have a combo with these two jigs. I seem to remember when I, when I went up there, I, th I spent about $250 for the combination of both jigs. Um, so it wasn't horrendous. Nothing in the, you know, it's cheap, but... So, I'm going to take this off here now. I'm going to leave this indexing wheel on there now because I don't want to have to bother taking off, uh, you, you know, this thing off of the, off of the lathe right now because I still have to, I still have to sand this down. Put this off. I still have to sand this down, I'm uh, sorry, the face of this down before we can glue up the, uh, glue up the cap ring. This guy is not part of that uh, jig you get from um, Chef Work Kits. This is a is a free spinning, this is, this is live, so this will spin, uh, you know, normally, let me get another one, normally a chuck you put in here is, is not live. It doesn't move, um, and it's it's good if you were gonna like drill something in. You put you put a bit in here, you spin them, spin the work, and you could drill a hole in this direction. But I like this um, free spinning guy for a couple of reasons, and I'll show you, you'll see it later on when we go to um, remove the waste block here. I'll show you how I use this. I will. Uh, I'll see you back after this dries.